Well, I'm going to be reading from John chapter 7 this morning, so if you have the word, John chapter 7 and verses 37 to 39. And I want to say uh, how much I appreciate being here and getting to uh, walk among you in these days and visit with you. There's some people in the auditorium I already know. Um, I was in Del Norte uh, Baptist Church on Sunday, and Ira's right there in front of me. He's right there in front of me. I was in Walmart yesterday and ran into somebody that I knew. How about that? Walmart. I'm almost one of you now. And Mike Napier telling about our experiences with the Lord um, before I get up. Um, he's almost got me in, you know, you, you, you shed a little tear there, Mike. But I want to say about Mike, what a wonderful, wonderful thing it is to see the Spirit in him and to see him bear much fruit in New Mexico. It's a great blessing in my life. Now, I'm going to talk about old people today. And I'm going to use all kinds of terms for old people, older folks and senior adults. And I don't usually use those terms, but I don't have any way to communicate with you without using those terms. I usually just call the, the folks my friends. That's what we call each other, our, our friends. In fact, everybody who works in our organization is on the friends team and is a friend. And I want to tell you what I'm going to say before I say it, because I want you to be able to think about it the whole time that we're talking. And what I'm going to talk about today is a great opportunity that we have in front of us. We've never been here before as a state and as churches and as a country. We've never been here before where we are today. And you know what I'm talking about as far as age. And the second thing that I'm going to say to you today is that there's not really any difference between a person who's 30 in the Spirit, in Christ, and a person who's 80 in Christ or 90 in Christ. There's not really any difference. I wish somebody had told me that when I was much younger. There's not really any difference. The Spirit is alive in a 90-year-old, and I can see it every day as we serve with people. Now, the last thing that I'm going to tell you is something that could sort of blow your mind, and you're going to have to think about it, because this is what I think. This is where the opportunity that we have. Ministries to seniors in the future look a lot like youth ministries. They do. They look a lot like youth ministries. I don't know if that resonates with you. I don't know if that sinks in with you, but they look a lot like youth ministries. Now, if I may, I'm going to read a description of a senior's ministry in a church that I took off a website. And I'm going to read a description of a youth ministry that I took off a website. And I'm not going to tell you which is which. And you tell me which is which, okay? All right, so here we go. Description of youth ministry taken off a website, or description of one or the other taken off a website. Game day and lunch once a month. Game night and potluck once a month. Bus trips and outings planned throughout the year. Now, you just think about which, which one that is. Now, here's a description of a youth ministry. We expect to help students become mature followers of Christ that reach upward, inward, and outward to impact the world for God's glory. And so you, you figured out which was which. Youth ministry, seniors ministry in the future needs to look a lot like youth ministry. Now, I've served seniors for 23 years. And they range in age from 60 to 105, 106. In fact, my oldest friend is 106. And she's a retired missionary to India. And this says everything you really need to know about me and what I think when I say that she's still a missionary, where she lives today at 106, which is in a nursing home where she ministers every day. 
And I go to a fair number of birthday parties for 80, 90, and 100 years old people. And you might think that birthday parties for 80 and 90 and 100 year old people are not very exciting. But that's not true. They're very exciting. Because once you bring out that cake that has all those candles on it, like 80, 90, or 100 candles on it, and once that very loud alarm system goes off, which triggers that very wet sprinkler system, which causes a very fast fire department run, really standing around singing happy birthday with a bunch of firefighters and older folks is really, really very, very fun thing. Nothing better than that. We often ask seniors who are part of our ministry this question. I think it's a good question. I think it's a start to a good question. I think it's a question we need to ask ourselves. And that is, we ask seniors who come to be a part of our ministry, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? We ask them that question. Now, I know that's not a very good question, but that's how we start. A much better question is to ask them, what does God want you to do with the rest of your life? And there's even a better question than that is, and that is, what is it that stands between you and God? Now, recently, we asked a person who was in their 80s that question, and he said, why would you ask me that? I only have perhaps two years to live. And we said, you may have two years to live. Why wouldn't you start something new? His entire perspective changed with that question. All of a sudden, he had two years to serve the Lord, perhaps, if the Lord didn't, didn't take him to heaven sooner. So the scripture, the setting for this scripture is the Feast of Tabernacles, a very joyous time, a time when they look to God's provision in the wilderness, when they look to God's provision in the present with the harvest, and a time when they look to God's provision in the future, a time of great joy. And on the eighth day, of the great festival, Jesus stands up and cries out in a loud voice, all who are thirsty, come to me and drink. While I read this scripture, will you think about and recall those times in your life when you, the time in your life when you believed, you were thirsty and you came to Jesus and drank? And the times in your life that you have been thirsty and have kept on coming to Jesus to drink? And then I'm going to read a short passage out of the book of Acts about the Spirit and what happened there. So in John chapter 7, now on the last day, the, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, From his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those he believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And then Acts chapter 2, again, as you remember how the Spirit has led and worked in your life over the years, as you think ahead to those older years of your life, when the Spirit will work in your life the rest of your life. In Acts chapter 2, the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter preached, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. They were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise was with you and your children and for all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. God's provision proclaimed. We 
point people to Jesus together. And we point people to Jesus together our entire life, not just part of our life. In thousands of churches across the United States, every Sunday during the week, we proclaim Christ. Millions of individual Christians proclaiming Christ. And all of us coming together in the cooperative program to share Jesus around the world that thirsty men might drink and believe. Now, there's something that's happening, which you're already aware of. It's not any, this is not any message to you that this is happening. But there's something happening in our country that's brand new, and we've never been there before, and that's, of course, a tsunami wave of older folks. Now, a few years ago, I didn't know what a tsunami was, but we've had them. We had a tsunami a few years ago, and our disaster relief folks were so involved in that effort to relieve people and their hurt and pain. We had a tsunami, and I've read books on tsunami, and I understand what, what, what we're talking about. We're going to a new place in our state and in our country and there are, going to be a lot of, there are going to be a lot of old folks. A tsunami wave comes in slow. You don't really see it. It comes in fast. You don't really see it, but it's moving real fast. And when it gets, when it gets close to the, to the shore, there's a huge tidal wave that comes in. So that's what we call this aging movement that's going on. Call it a tidal wave. Call it a tsunami. And it's going to change a lot for us. It's going to change a lot in your state. We're going from one in eight people being over 65 in our country to one in five people being over 65 in our country. In New Mexico, and let me see if I can recall these, these numbers. In New Mexico, um, you're going to have, by 2030, 55% of your population is going to be over 50. 55% of your population is going to be over 50. And 45 is going to be under 50. And that may be 40. I may have, I may have gotten that wrong. Right now in New Mexico, 32% of the people in New Mexico, 37% of the people in New Mexico are over 60 right now. And so we have a big change that's coming um, in our lives and in our churches. And the over 60 population is growing while the under 60 pop population is, is shrinking. Now, what is old? I don't really deal in it myself. I don't really deal in, in old. You know, I'm around people who are over 100 years old and I don't really deal in old. So what is old? I'm not sure what old is, but I remember the first time somebody called me old. I was 30 years old, and Susan's right down here on the second row, and we were at her high school reunion. And somebody came up to me and handed me a box of those bubbles with wands, and you blow bubbles and that kind of thing. Handed me one of those bubbles with wands, and I started handing them out to the little kids. So I'm going around handing the bubbles out to little kids, and one of the little girls goes over to her mother and said, who gave you those bubbles? And she pointed at me, I'm 30 years old, and she says, some old man. <laughs> so that's the first time anybody ever called me old. You know, this is what people say today. People are saying, our churches are full of old people. I hear that all the time. What does that mean? Our churches are full of old people. I'll tell you this. Age is completely and totally relative. It's, it's completely and totally relative. I could have a 10-year-old girl come up here on the platform right now and look out at you, and I could go, I could say, the church is full of old people. And she would look out there and she'd say, it sure is. Or I could go to a church and talk to a 20-year-old. And I could say, the church is full of old people. And they would say, because old is always 15 years older than you are, and they would say, it sure is. There's a bunch of people around here that are like married and have two kids. <laughs> or I could go to a 75-year-old, a 
a 75-year-old, and I could say, the church is full of old people. And they would say, really? I, I didn't know that. Or I could go to a 90-year-old, and to the 90-year-old I could say, the church is full of old people. And the 90-year-old would say, and I know this because I've said, I've said it before. The 90-year-old would say, well, we're not old, but we're getting there. Is this age tsunami that we have facing us in our state, is it an opportunity or is it a problem? Now, we have to ask ourselves, is it an opportunity or is it a problem? Because sometimes I think people look at, look at it as a problem. Our churches are filled of old people. What are they saying? I read an article, and I read a lot of articles about older people, but I, I read an article that said this. Now, you, you help me figure out the title to this article. This is the title to this article. I don't understand why it's phrased this way. But we need to think about these things. The title of the article says, Seniors are an important part of the church today, but they are often overlooked. Now look, seniors are the most humble people I know. They don't want any attention called to themselves. They want to serve, and they want to serve shoulder to shoulder and side by side. But we have an article, and someone titles the article, Seniors are very important in the church today, but they're often overlooked. Now, now, which is it? Things that are important to me, I, I don't often overlook. And I read from a North American Mission Board publication these things that I'm going to share with you. Back to the youth ministry for a moment. Think with me, because I'm going to change these statements, and I'm going to ask you, what would we do about this? What would we do about this? I'm taking these statements from a North American Mission Board publication. Most Christian seniors don't share their faith. Okay, now let's change that for a minute. What are we going to do about that? Well, let's change that for a minute. Let's change that to youth. Most youth don't share their faith. Now, I will tell you that if that statement was true, most youth don't share their faith, and I know that it, I know that it is true. But we would look at that statement completely different if, it's, if it said most youth don't, don't share their faith. What would we do? What would you do? I'm asking you, what would you do in your church? What would you do differently? I guarantee you, you would. Thank you. You would, you would teach them how to witness. Senior adults don't know how to witness. We assume they do. They don't know how to witness, by and large. Second, in this North American Mission Board publication. Now, this is, this is, what, this is what, what is written in the publication. Evangelizing older adults is not a priority in most churches. Most people believe that senior adults will not respond positively so, to the gospel. So, to spend time, effort, and resources is a waste of time. Now, that's a tragic statement, I'll grant you. That is a tragic statement. Now, I'm going to change it, and I'm going to say this, Evangeling youth, evangelizing youth is not a priority in most churches. Most youth will not respond positively to the gospel, so to spend time, effort, and resources is a waste of time. Now, I think, I think we would look completely differently on that statement if it was about youth. We would be all about gearing up. We would be all about equipping. We would be all about getting ready to share the gospel with youth. Now, listen to this one. I'm just, I'm just sharing with you where we live. We need to talk about it. Now, listen to this one. Aging in most churches means a reduction in the responsibility the church extends to them. This is out of a North American Mission Board publication. Aging means that we are going to reduce the time, reduce the ministry that we spend in the church. In other words, we're going to lower, we're going to lower our expectations. And the last one. Senior adults see themselves as having completed their active ministry in the church, 
and lowered, and lowered expectations. And that's lowered expectations too. Senior adults see themselves as completed their ministry in the church. And that's also lowering our expert expectations. Now, let me ask you, does it have to be that way? No, it doesn't have to be that way. That's why I started by telling you that a really solid seniors ministry look, needs to look a lot like youth ministry. That we need to be equipping seniors. That we need to be discipling seniors. When I was on a church staff, we were having, it's the same church staff that, that Mike was part of when he was saved. It was that church staff. And we were having a, a, a campaign in our church, get everybody involved, witnessing evangelism, Sunday school campaign. And the staff was having a meeting on a Tuesday afternoon, and we talked about how can we get everybody involved in the church? How can we get every age group involved in the church? And I was, I was 30, 32, something like that. I was that, about that age. And we talked about the preschoolers and everything that we could do to get the preschoolers involved. We talked about the youth, and we came up with all these ideas of how the youth could be involved in this campaign. And we talked about the adults and all the things that they could do. And then we came to the senior adults, and we, and you know what we did. We looked at each other, and finally somebody said, well, the senior adults can what? They can pray. And of course they can pray, and they must pray, and we need prayer. But what we were doing was we were revealing, I mean, we were really revealing that we didn't ever even understand how the body of Christ worked in that time together and in that campaign. Now, I know that it may be hard to understand this. I'm, I know you're going to have to think about this. I know I'm sharing concepts that, that are, you haven't thought about before. I know that. I'm fully aware of it. But I'll tell you this. One of the reasons that people reduce their ministry as they get older is this. I've seen it a hundred times. Here's what we do, and we do this in love, and you have to understand that we do it in love. And everybody needs to hear me when I say we do this in love. This is totally and completely in love. What we begin to do is we begin to care for senior adults. There's no magic age. It's not a number. But what we do is we begin to care for senior adults. And we're doing it all in love. Every bit of it's in love. But what happens is we begin to care for senior adults. And we begin to send signals to them. And this is what's going on in our churches. We begin to send signals to senior adults. Oh, we understand that you really can't anymore. We understand that. We understand that you need to cut back. We understand, every bit of this is done in love. We understand that you need to come back, cut back. Now, at first, seniors are confused by this at first. They're confused by this, and every bit of this is in love. And we begin to care for them, and they begin to feel it, and they begin to think that they're not so needed anymore. And they begin to say something like this after they're confused. And I've heard this from seniors. I don't know if you have or not, but I've heard this from seniors. They begin to say, I love my church, but I don't feel like there's much I can do anymore. I love my church, but I don't feel like there's much I can do anymore. Now, understand that we do this in love. Every bit of this in, is in love. We understand that you can't anymore. It's okay. And let me tell you what happens. What happens is we begin to care for them instead of serve with them. We begin to care for them instead of serve with them. And they go down here and we go up here. And all of a sudden we can do something for them, but they can't do something for us. That's the signal that we've sent them. That's the signal that we've sent the older folks in our church. Now, I can't tell you how much we need the older folks in our church to become equipped. 70s, 80s, 90s, you name it. I can't tell you how much we need the older folks to become equipped because we have a tsunami coming. And we need people ready to tell other people about Jesus. It's not okay to start caring for people and giving them the impression that we don't expect much out of them anymore. We need to focus on what the body of Christ can do. 
You need to focus on what the body of Christ can do. In your own individual life, you need to focus on what you can do. Now, I'm 58 years old, and things just aren't working like they used to, you know? You, you get it? You understand what I'm talking about. Things don't work like they used to. But we need to focus on what we, we can do for, for, for the Lord. We need to focus on what He calls us to do. We need to focus on what seniors can do. Seniors, 70s, 80s, 90s, 100 years old, can witness. Absolutely. Can be discipled and disciple others. Absolutely. Love other people in the community. Give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. All those things. Now, there's some things they can't do. They probably can't play guard on the church basketball team anymore. That's probably not something that they can do anymore. The key to being a senior in Christ is not to be so concerned about what you can't do, but to be concerned about what God can do through you in your 70s and 80s and 90s. The word serve is a much better word than care. There's nothing wrong with the word care. There's nothing wrong, but we get care all the time when we're seniors. It's health care this and it's health care that, and it's always care, care, care. Serve is a much better word than care to use with seniors. It conveys what we do together. Here's what we do together. We serve God together. We serve one another together. We serve shoulder to shoulder. We serve others in Jesus' name. Seniors want to serve. Now look, when you say that we're serving together and I'm 90 years old, all of a sudden I'm right up here. I'm right there with you. I'm serving with you. I'm serving shoulder to shoulder with you. Now, the church can look at seniors in a way that mirrors the world. And we need to guard ourselves against that. The world looks at seniors a certain way. The world looks at seniors as people who have already done their thing. People who are wrinkled, and all they see is the wrinkles. The world looks at seniors like a fuel tank on a car. The world looks at seniors like this. When you are young, you have a full tank, and you can do a lot of people a lot of good. And when you are old, you have an empty tank, and you can't do anybody any good. That's the way the world looks at seniors. And we have to guard against that, coming into the way that we look at things. That's the way the world looks at seniors. Listen to these verses of hope. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. To each, to each is given the manifestation for the common good. To each. Second, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit we, were all, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. That's all of us, from the very youngest in Christ to the very oldest in Christ. I had a friend, still have a friend, he's in heaven. I don't like to talk to people in terms of past tense. They're in heaven. I have a friend named Abe Dutchendorf, and he was on our board of directors. Great guy. He was a state representative for 12 years. And he was a teacher and a coach in the Lawton, Oklahoma school district. He went to be with the Lord when he was 77 years old, and on the very last day of his life, on the very last day of his life, he was serving a meal to seniors in his church, Trinity Baptist Church in Lawton. In fact, not only did he do that on the last day of his life, he was doing it, he was serving that meal when he went to be with the Lord. On the last day of his life, he went to be with the Lord, serving a meal to homeless people at his church, Abe Dutchendorf, an example in the Spirit. Verse 28 of this passage, we are alive together with Christ. We are alive together with Christ, Ephesians 2, 5. God's doing something wonderful among older folks. I see it. You see it too. And may it grow and grow and grow. God's doing something wonderful among older folks. I teach a flock, a small group. We have three teachers. I'm, I teach every third Sunday. God's doing wonderful things in this flock, among the people in this flock. These folks are 60 to 75 years old. 60 to 75 years old, the people are in this flock. And every Sunday, we are absolutely 
excited. I don't have words for it. I've tried to explain this several times. I don't have words for it. The Spirit is alive in these people. We have a man named Dwayne who right now is in Ecuador, and this is what he said. Now, remember, this is a flock between 60 and 75 years old. We have a man who right now is in Ecuador who said last Sunday in the flock, I'm going to Ecuador. We're going to try to start a work in a new area of the country where we don't have a work. And I'm hoping to connect with some Christians, and I'm hoping to find a place to sleep. That's in a flock of people from 60 to 75 years old. He doesn't know where he's going to sleep. He's just going there to try to connect with some Christians. And we want to start a new work in that part of Ecuador. We have another couple in our, in our flock, Robert and Saritha. And Robert and Saritha are also in Ecuador, not related to where Duane is. Completely different area. They're between 60 and 75. They're newly retired. And they're in Ecuador for three months. And they're so excited. And I read their blog, and Satan is attacking them. And they're doing a wonderful work with children in Ecuador. And I have another man in my flock, and his name is Sam. And Sam feels led of the Lord to start a ministry with people who have me- families of people who have mental illness. I talk to Sam a lot about this. Sam struggles with this call. Sam's an engineer. Sam's in a secure position. Sam says to me, I think God's leading me to quit my job. I said, Sam, has God ever done anything like this in your life before? Never. His son says he doesn't even recognize his dad anymore. This is a flock between 60 and 75 years old. Ken and Karen Dormer are in that flock too. Ken is 68 years old. They're leaving all their grandchildren. They're going across the country from Oklahoma City to Virginia. And Ken feels called of God to be involved as a teacher, as a physician in the new medical school at Liberty University. He wants to be involved in the lives of Christian doctors that are going to go out all over the world. This flock is people between 60 and 75 years old. We have a ministry I've got to tell you about in Oklahoma. I pray that it can be replicated here. It already is in some ways. I know that. I absolutely know that. And this ministry is called Link. And what we do is we go to care centers. We go to nursing homes. We go to assisted living centers. And we walk in the door and we literally just say, what are your needs? And it's music to our ears when they say we need a Bible study. We need a worship service. And then what we do is we go to a church right there in that neighborhood and we link them together. A team is formed. It's not older people going to minister to older people. It's older older people and it's middle-aged adults and it's youth and it's children going to minister with the Christians who are there in the nursing home. And we've done it 175 times or more in Oklahoma. A church and a care center down the street. And people who are 80 and 90 who live in that nursing center who say, I can't really be involved in my church anymore. Oh, but they can. Because when we go there, we're not going to minister to them. We're going to minister with them. All the people who are in Christ are on the team. And it's children and it's middle-aged adults, and it's youth, and it's older adults who form the team. And it's happened over 175 times in Oklahoma. Now now listen to me. They're just, they're down the street. They're right down the street. I know it's nursing home ministry. I know that there's sort of a block when I say nursing home ministry in some, some minds, some lives, but they're just down the street. There's 100 people that live there. There's 100 people that work there, and they're all ages. There's the families of the people who live there, and they're younger. There's the families of the people who work there, and they're younger. Now, my math's not good, but that's like 100, 200, 300. That's like 600. 
That's like 600 people. You want to build a bridge to 600 people in a nursing home? All age people? You want to build a bridge? And you want to go to that nursing home and you want to link up with the Christians who are already living in that nursing home? That the 90-year-old that lives there that can never leave that nursing home has a ministry in Christ, in the Spirit, in her life? Do you want that kind of ministry down the street from the church building? It's an absolutely extraordinary ministry. And it's about evangelism. And it's about discipleship. That's what it's about, the link ministry in Oklahoma. Roy Interline is 97. Another good friend, Roy Interline. And he had an article um, in the paper, in the Broken Arrow newspaper about him recently. And I, I just have a, I have a, I have a thing about this, 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 this title that they put in news, newspapers. I have a thing about this title that says, Roy Interline, 97 years old, still serves the Lord. Still serves the Lord. I know the Bible says that planted by the rivers, they shall still bring forth food. I know the word still's in there, but it kind of bugs me a little bit when it says Roy Interline, 97-year-old, still serves the Lord. What in the world would we expect Roy Interline to be doing? He's the chaplain at Baptist Village of Broken Arrow, and he serves the Lord every day. By the way, in that article, it's printed. He asked the reporter, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? It's in the article, 97 years old. Sometimes we look at that verse that says they will still bring, home, bring forth fruit in old age. Sometimes we look at that verse and we say, see, there's some people that are still bringing forth fruit like it's a surprise. But that verse is not a surprise. That verse is a promise. They still will. That verse is even an expectation for people who are older. When Christian seniors come to BV, the BVC ministry, there's an expectation. When a Christian senior comes to the BVC ministry, there's an expectation. We expect that they're going to serve the Lord with us. We expect them to serve the Lord with us. I don't know what you've been doing in your church, but you're going to have to step it up here. Now, really, it doesn't go to that extreme, of course. And once we expect it, they want to do it. Once we expect it, they want to do it. You know, if I came to New Mexico and found Mike Napier not serving the Lord, I guarantee you we'd be having a little talk, Mr. Napier. And I guarantee you if you came to Oklahoma and found me not serving the Lord, I guarantee you'd be having a little talk with me. We have an expectation. Now, think about this. Have you had physical therapy? Have you ever had physical therapy? Knee replacement, hip replacement, you've had physical therapy. Wow, physical therapy, boy, the expectations are really high. They're really high. I mean, we're pushing and shoving and, and we're expecting and we're working together, the physical therapist and the person who's getting physical therapy. We've got a big tsunami wave coming and we have an army of seniors in our churches and we can disciple them and we can teach them to witness and they can witness. And by the way, I hear a lot of people saying that in-home visitation doesn't work anymore. And I understand what they mean. I understand that. I completely understand it. But I want you to know there's one group of people. It will work. It will work. They want you to come to their home. They want you to tell them about Jesus. And they want you to visit with them. The other night on Facebook, I saw a post from a pastor friend of mine named Ray Early. And the post was, 71-year-old man just got saved. And it was on a Monday night, so I, I replied and I said, are you telling me that people from the church went to his home and led him to the Lord? And he said, yes. Don't tell me that in-home visitation won't work with seniors. So is it possible I know we've been going down this road talking about seniors, talking about youth ministers. Is it possible for a group of senior adults to be fired up in the Lord? Is it possible for our whole senior adult group to be fired up in the Lord? To be all about witnessing and to be all about discipleship and to be fired up in the Lord like we used to be when we were in a youth group. Is it possible for that to happen? The last time the tsunami came through, 
We, the baby boomers, were teenagers. See, we've, we've seen this tsunami before. We were teenagers then. And they tell me that the church was caught unaware. The church was not ready for it at all. And we're not ready for it again. And what we did is we formed youth ministries. And we hired youth ministers. And we were all about witnessing. And we were all about discipleship. And we were all about ministry. And Susan and I were definitely part of that. And our youth minister, Larry Link, First Baptist Church, Arlington, Texas, is a, ministry to, is a minister to boomers right now. In fact, he calls it the ministry, boom, ministry to boomers. We were part of that. And people say, said we were on fire for Christ. Can it happen again? Can it happen again? Can we, who are older in the church, I'm including myself, can we who are older in the church, can the church organize quickly? Can we become all about in our seniors' ministries, witnessing and discipleship and missions and prayer and all of those things? Tom Rayner, who's president of Lifeway, wrote an article, and this is what this, he wrote five major trends of the church. Five major trends. Number three is this. Senior adult ministries will experience steep declines. That's a trend that he says. And they will. Unless we change. Unless we get ready. And number five was this. Number five major trend was the boomers are receptive to the gospel. The boomers are receptive to the gospel. You know why the boomers are receptive to the gospel now? Because they know they're going to die. They know they're going to die. Boomers know they're going to die now. And they're more receptive to the gospel. What a great opportunity we have. What an unprecedented opportunity we have. Now let me ask you this. Do you see it? Do you see it? Let me see your heads if you see it. Do you see it? Can we get ready for it? We point people to Jesus together, all of us, in Christ. We are alive together in Christ. The time is now. The Spirit is given and Jesus is glorified. Here's a description of a future senior adult ministry in New Mexico. Here's a description of a future senior adult ministry in New Mexico. Our ministry exists to help seniors become mature followers of Christ that reach upward, inward, and outward to impact the world for God's glory. I close with a story about Beulah Wood, 97 and a half years old when she went to be with the Lord. On the very last day of Beulah Wood's life, she was talking about going home. I'm going home today in the nursing home where she lived, Baptist Village of Oklahoma City. She told her friends she was going home that day, and at lunch she told her friends, the, the folks she, had, she ate lunch with, I'm going home today. And they said, Beulah, you're not going home. You, you live here. And she said, oh, I know where I live. I'm going home today. And that went on through the day. And in the evening, in the evening in her room, on the 3 to 11 shift, a nurse came in to do a treatment on her legs. And she said, oh, let's not do that today. Let's not do that treatment today. But would you get my Bible off the dresser? She got her Bible and she said to the nurse, do you know God's grace? The reason I know about this is because the nurse sent me a letter. And the nurse said she was crying so much that she couldn't hardly stop crying. And Beulah shared God's grace with the nurse, and the nurse was saved. The evening went on. Now we're on the 11 to 7 shift, and there's another nurse there. And the nurse came into Beulah's room and got, brought some supplies. And then she left and said she'd be back in a minute. 
And sure enough, when she came back into the room, Beulah had gone home to be with the Lord. On the very last day of Beulah Wood's life, 97 and a half years old, she was prepared for the Spirit to use her in a mighty way, sharing the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for what you're doing in our lives. We are thankful for what's coming our way. We see it as a great opportunity. Father, I pray that we would prepare. I pray that we'd be ready. I pray we, we would equip ourselves. I pray that we would witness to people wherever they are. They're receptive, Lord. Thank you for making them such. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Pierce. Well, I uh, was going to ask you to go ahead and stand again. We have just one more session here before lunch. It's always this moment in the day that I start getting a little hungry. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> let's sing this together. It's a great old hymn. Everybody knows this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears That grace appeared the hour I first believed through many years, through many dangers, toil and snares. I have already come. I have already. And grace will lead me home. Come on, let's do that last verse, everybody. When we been there, bright shining as the sun. Then when we first began. I like that last verse, don't you? You know, uh, John Newton didn't even write that verse. It's uh, found in Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. You'll find that little poem in there. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. I love those lines right there. We've no less days. In other words, after 10,000 years of praising the Lord and singing at his feet, we'll just be getting started. I like that, don't you?